from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight I want to read a passage of scripture that was on the cake that they presented to my oldest grandson the day that he was confirmed. And this was on the cake. It was third epistle of John, the fourth verse. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Of course, John was talking about those young converts of his that he called his children. But here we could apply it to our families and to our own children. You know, the other night, a 20-year-old couple got married on Friday night in Ohio. They came to Toronto on their honeymoon, attended the crusade Tuesday night, and responded to the invitation to receive Jesus Christ. And the counselor said the husband immediately started taking his role as the spiritual leader of the home because he said, we're going to get into the Word of God. And the counselor added, what a wedding present that was. There was a man here the other night who is one of the chief karate instructors in South Africa on his way home to Johannesburg. And after taking some refresher classes in Japan, he stopped here for two days. He attended the crusade, accepted Christ as his savior. 41 years old, he said, I'm rushing back to Johannesburg to tell my wife and family that I have found Jesus Christ. And we've had story after story and if I'd had time tonight, I was going to tell you some more stories of people that have found Christ here in this tremendous crusade here in Toronto during these days. But I want to get quickly to what makes up a happy home or how you can have an, a, the right kind of a home. And the first point that I would like to make is that God performed the first marriage in the Garden of Eden. And it was God's idea to have a family in the first place, before the cities and governments, written language, before nations, temples, churches, there were families. And the family is the most important institution in the world. The first miracle that Jesus ever performed was at a wedding at Cana of Galilee. And Jesus was underscoring the importance of the home because if the home goes, the nation is going to go. It was my privilege the other day to talk to the Prime Minister of this country and today to the Premier of Ontario. And in, on both occasions, it was interesting how we got to this idea of how the home is a basic unit and the home cannot be separated from the health of the nation or of the province. Many today are wringing their hands with fear and insecurity. But more important than what happens at Wall Street or what happens at the United Nations is what is happening to our families. In the home, character is formed. Integrity is born. Values we live by are made clear. Goals are set. Attitudes are formed that last a lifetime. Is your home built on a solid foundation? That's the question I want to ask. Remember the man Jesus told about that built his house on a rock? Is your house built on a rock? Is your home secure tonight? Or is it filled with tension? Is it about ready to break up? We've had more couples come forward here that were living together without marriage or more couples come forward here that have been separated and more couples that have been divorced that have come here together and be reunited than almost any crusade we've held in a long time. And it indicates to me that this is a growing problem in Toronto and it's a growing problem in this part of Canada as well as in the United States and other parts of the world. The third point I'd like to make is that our modern life puts tremendous pressures on the home and the family. You know some of the pressures that the home faces today. It reminds me of Nehemiah, the fourth chapter, where the scripture says there is much rubbish so that we're not able to build a wall. And we see rubbish everywhere. Rubbish on television and in films and in magazines. Making fun of the home, making fun of marriage, making light of one of the holiest of all institutions, the marriage 
And God has indicated from one end of the word to the other that when the home fails, the society is going to fail. And I tell you this, unless we have a spiritual revival and our homes are renewed, the nation is going to be destroyed. There's no way that we can escape the judgment of God unless we come back to Christian or to God-fearing homes. You know, we're living in cities today. All over the world, people are moving to cities. As a boy on the farm, I could watch my father work and was made part of that work. Today, a man goes to work in a factory on office and his wife goes off to work too. And often the children never see either one of them doing their jobs and they never become a part of it. In small rural communities of yesterday, everyone knew everyone. Teachers and parents were friends. But the working mother or the two career family is already upon us. And many times it's impossible to escape it because of taxes and because of inflation and all the rest of it. In order to make a living, both parents have to work in many instances. But Ezekiel 16 says, as is the mother, so is her daughter. As is the mother, so is her daughter. Which indicates that we as parents are to set the example in front of our children of Bible reading, of prayer, of integrity, of truthfulness, of honesty, and let them see in us Jesus Christ. Because one could say, as the father, so the son, as well as the mother and her daughter. And we have that responsibility as Christians. But we're glorifying today not getting married. I read the other day that 1,500,000 couples are living together in the United States without any intention of ever getting married. And the number of those getting married is decreasing and the number of divorces is mounting until one of our great sociologists said recently at Columbia University that we may not have any homes at all by the end of this century. It may be something of the past. And sex is now treated by many like a physical appetite to be satisfied completely apart from any meaningful relationship. Just like you go out and buy a hamburger to satisfy your appetite. So you go out and have sex. That's not what God meant it to be at all. It's a holy gift from God to be used within matrimony. But there's a satanic attack on the family today. Even Christian families are feeling it. I've never heard so many stories of Christian families even having so much tension and so much difficulty. We've never had more books on the bookshelves telling us how to solve our family problems or sexual problems than we have today. And yet somehow we're more miserable, we're more broken, we're more torn, we're more hurt than we've ever been. Why? Because we have not taken the Word of God into account because God has laid down the rules and the regulations for a successful and happy home. And we've broken them. We thought we could do it some other way and we found that we failed. Let's come back to the Bible. Let's come back to the Word of God and build our homes on this book and the God that performed the first marriage. The fourth point I would like to make is that the family is still the most durable institution in the world. Historically, the family has survived all attacks. But many today want love without commitment. The latest polls indicate that young people may be turning back toward the family relationships and commitments, and it's most encouraging. Perhaps the tide is beginning to turn. I pray that it will be. I believe it is beginning to turn in the United States, and I'm happy to see it because, you see, even in Russia and China where they profess atheism, they're finding they cannot build a strong society without a home. They experimented at first without homes. They laughed at marriage, but now they've changed their minds. And then the fifth thing I'd like to say is the family needs help and encouragement. God is interested in your family. 
your marriage, your children. He shows us the ideals and the goals for the family, and he's willing to help us. Ezra said, Then I proclaimed a fast there to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones. Seeking God's will for your family. That's what Ezra was doing, seeking the will of God for his family. Have you sought God's will? Have you gotten on your knees and committed your children to the Lord time after time? Do you gather them together for family devotions? Or are you too embarrassed to? Or too hypocritical to? What keeps you from doing it? Because it's been proven statistically that the homes that have Bible reading and prayer and go to church every Sunday, there's only one divorce in 400 marriages. While the national average in the United States is now almost one out of every two marriages. The answer is God. The answer is spiritual. The answer is surrendering your heart and your life to Jesus Christ as parents, as children, so that every member of the home knows Jesus Christ and loves the Word of God. And then the next point I would like to make is that the husband-wife relationship is the key to the family's success. Nearly all the psychologists or sociologists that I've talked to and books that I've read indicate that the home will only rise so high as the husband-wife relationship. The children seeing love between the husband and the wife. You see, many people get married without any idea of how much is at stake and laying the foundation for failure in the very beginning in courtship. You be careful who you go with and fall in love with. Be sure that he or she is God-fearing and loves Christ. The Scripture says, Be not unequally yoked together. How many of you have tried it and failed? There must be a spiritual oneness. There are three people that make up a marriage, the husband, the wife, and God. And be sure God is in your marriage. You see, so many are marrying someone with whom they have a very little chance of having a successful marriage. Seventeen magazine made a survey some time ago of young men and they asked the young men many questions and one of the questions was What do you want your girlfriend to have on the first date and the number one answer was a good figure? I would say the number one answer as far as I'm concerned would be to love the Lord with all her heart and all her mind Many marry without being aware of the ideals and the goals which God has set for marriage you see, God planned marriage for people with some maturity. Now, you can be mature when you're 17. You can be mature when you're 18, and you can be absolutely immature at 40. I see some little teenage 40-year-olds trotting around, and there are many of them. The Scripture says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, you must be people who are ready to emotionally leave home. Now you think about that. We're always to love our parents. I don't care where you go to the ends of the earth. You're to love your parents. You're to confer with your parents. You're to honor your parents. You're to enjoy your parents. But when you get married, you must realize that they can never, that you can never again depend on them as you did when you were little children. Many parents ruin the marriage of their children by refusing to turn them loose. Learn when to turn them loose. For this cause shall a man leave, and his wife must be first, the husband must be first, while still honoring and loving and seeking the advice and the counsel of the parents. And the parents must learn how to turn loose. And when you turn them loose, I'm going to tell you something. When you turn them loose, 
they'll come back to you closer than ever as adults and you'll enjoy them as much as you ever did and then God wants marriages to be permanent until death do us part many people enter the marriage vow without any idea that this is for keeps a young man at the marriage altar thinking to himself if this doesn't work out I'll get a divorce yes tensions are going to come there's going to be that adjustment period and you keep adjusting the rest of your life there'll be problems there'll be disagreements but you're to accept each other's faults your wife is not perfect and your husband is not perfect you found that out after about two days that first morning you saw her in curlers and that first morning when she saw, saw you get up bleary eyed and it's not always romantic But we are to be together in a relationship that God has formed. We become one flesh. And many people that have been married for many years have loved each other so much and been together so much and know each other so well that they begin to look like each other. That's actually true. People tell me that I look like Ruth. If that's true, I'm getting mighty good looking. And I'll tell you, when I haven't seen her in two weeks, she looks better than ever. <laughs> but there must be a lifetime commitment when you come to Christ. It's forever. Repeat it to yourself. Forever, forever, forever. Till death do us part. Don't ever entertain the idea of separation and divorce. If you know Christ, He can hold you together. There is no problem that you face that cannot be solved by the Lord Jesus Christ. And then God's ideal is for the husband and the wife to be faithful to each other. Faithful to each other. I read the other day that 70% in a survey, 70% of the men it indicated were cheating on their wives. I just can't believe that statistic. I, I cannot allow myself to believe it. It didn't say how many wives cheated on their husbands. But I want to tell you the Bible calls it adultery. And the Bible says that no adulterer will be in heaven. We don't realize what a vile and terrible thing it is to break the marriage vow with that type of a sin. I know it's old-fashioned. I know that's out of date. But that's the teaching of the Word of God, and the Word of God never, 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 never changes. It's the same. God hasn't changed in all these centuries. Do you think that God is changing His whole nature to accommodate Himself to your sins? No. He's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. I'm the same God that hated the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, hate the sins that we're committing today in the countries of the world that I travel in because it's worldwide. To have an affair is said to put uh, spice in a marriage. I read that the other day in some newspaper. It's a sin against God and it breaks the marriage vow. And many of you are asking, well, what can I do to help my marriage? The first step is to turn your life over to Jesus Christ. Let Him come into your life. You say, well, how do I do that? We've seen hundreds and even thousands here in Toronto come to Christ. Be willing to repent of your sins. That's the first step. Realize that God loves you. In spite of your sins, in spite of your failure, He loves you and He's willing to forgive you, but you must be willing to repent. And that word repent means to change. Change your mind. Change the direction of your life. 
and determine that you're going to bring your life under the Lordship of Christ. If you failed in the home, if you failed at being a parent, if you failed at being a husband or a wife or a, an obedient child in the home, surrender your life to Christ tonight and let him come into your heart and help you to be the right kind of a husband or wife or the right kind of a child. We had a man come forward in Las Vegas to make his commitment to Christ and he and his wife were in the divorce courts. And he called her on the phone and he said, I'd like to come and see you. And he said, I'd like to settle this divorce business. And she didn't know what he meant. And so they got together and they went to the little restaurant where they'd been before and they fell in love all over again. They called their lawyers and said, call it off. We're being reunited in Christ. That can happen to you. Maybe you and your wife haven't separated, but spiritually you're separated. Emotionally you may be separated. Psychologically separated. Let Christ come in and bring you together. And then our children need help. Our children need help. They need your love. You know, I heard a psychiatrist say many years ago that helped me. They said, you know, your children may come to a point where they do rebel because most children come to a point where they're seeking their own identity and, and they may rebel for three or four years or five years, a little bit. Maybe some of them wildly rebel. This psychiatrist said, let them know that you disapprove, but that you love them. And when they come through that point of rebellion, and when they find their own identity, the love will still be there. Let the love of Christ dominate your family, dominate your relationships within the family, and you can have a wonderful home. It's not too late to repair it. It's not too late to change. You can start tonight. What do you have to do? Be willing to repent of your sin and receive Christ by faith into your heart. Notice I said by faith. You may not understand it all. You may not understand what I mean when I say accept Christ by faith. You don't have to understand it all. Come by simple childlike faith. Like a little child is trusting his father, you trust the heavenly father. Put your hand in his hand tonight and say, tonight, I want Christ. You see, he died on the cross for you. He shed his blood for you. He rose again from the dead, and he's alive, and the Bible says he's coming back again. You believe that and accept that, and that he's willing to come by the Holy Spirit and live in your heart tonight, right now. You don't have to live the Christian life alone. You don't have to be that husband alone or that wife alone or that child alone or that teenager alone. Christ will come into your heart right now tonight if you'll let him. And on this wet, damp, cold evening, what a wonderful moment to let Christ come into your own heart and you become the right kind of a husband, the right kind of a wife, the right kind of a son or daughter. I'm going to ask you to receive him right now. I'm going to ask hundreds of you to get up out of your seat right now and come out here on this field and stand here as a moment of recommitment or a moment of receiving Christ, whatever your reason for coming. You may be a member of the Anglican Church or the United Church or the Pentecostal Church or the Catholic Church, or you may not have any religious background. I don't know who you are, but I'm going to ask you to come and say tonight, I want Christ in my heart. I want him to be my Lord and my master and my savior. And I want to go back and be the right kind of a husband and the right kind of a wife. I want him to forgive my past. I want him to change me. I want to be the right kind of a young person in the home. I've been rebellious against my parents and I haven't lived a Christian life in the home, but I want to from this moment on. You may be here with your fiance or your sweetheart and you want to dedicate your lives together to Christ. You come. As people are already coming, you get up and come right now. No one leaving. 
as hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You that have been watching by television can see now that God has been wonderfully working and that you can come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Right now, accept Him. And if you'll make that commitment, we'll send you the same literature we're going to give the people here. Many hundreds and thousands of people have come to Christ here in Toronto, Ontario, and you can come to Christ where you are. Give your life and your heart to Him right now. God help you to make that commitment tonight. In, go to church next Sunday. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. Times, the Billy Graham Classics. And now before the message, here's a song from George Beverly Shea. I want to talk about Jesus Christ. I want to ask the question, who is Jesus? Many of us have crosses in, embossed on our Bibles or on our carrying around our neck, but we don't really know Jesus. You know, when you fly into Brazil, into Rio de Janeiro, there's a great big statue of Jesus. It's a landmark of Rio day and night. It stands 130 feet high. It's 130 feet from fingertip to fingertip with his arms outstretched. Someone has called this in this country the year of Jesus. One of the networks recently ran a mini-series on Jesus. My daughter has written a book called Just Give Me Jesus. There's a movement among teenagers that asks the question, what would Jesus do? Almost everybody has heard of Jesus, but millions don't know, really know who he is. 
They don't have him in their lives and in their hearts. And the world today is looking for Messiah to come and save us. Many years ago, the prophet Ezekiel said, I searched for a man among them, but I found none. In other words, God was searching for someone that he could put his hand on and bless and use, and he couldn't find anybody that was willing to totally surrender and commit their lives to him. The world today, if you read the newspapers and watch the telecast, news telecast, is rushing madly toward, I think, Armageddon. Tonight in the Middle East, they're battling again over the same things they've battled for hundreds of years. They've had meeting after meeting and truce after truce and treaty after treaty and promises made by all around. But somehow they can't quit their fighting. You see, man is a moral failure. God is our only hope. God's plans... God's plans are already formed and are clearly stated in the scriptures. And at his right hand, in heaven sits a man who was despised and ignored and rejected by men when he came to earth the first time, and who is still rejected and ignored by the majority of the human race. God has pledged that he will be the future world ruler. He will put down all rule and all authority and power. There's coming a day when every knee will bow to him and every tongue will confess his name. This year, 2000 AD, the calendar we use each day dates back to the birth of Jesus. We can't get away from him. Our generation cannot escape Jesus. Over the years, so many plays and books and operas and movies have been made about Jesus. In March and April, both Newsweek and U.S. News and World Report magazines had cover stories about him. In its Science and Ideas cover story, U.S. News carried the title, Why Did Jesus Die? Why is there so much interest in Jesus today? Is that the question you've asked? Who is this person? Who has done so much to transform human history than any man that ever lived? He only lived 33 years. His longest journey was less than 100 miles. Is he just a folk hero or a revolutionary? Or is, who he, is he who he claimed to be? The son of the living God. Who is this person? that demands we call him Son of God and follow him even to death. We know he was a man. He was completely human. He was the representative man. He was the all-out man. He was identified and numbered with the transgressors, the scripture says. Eighty-three times in the New Testament he's called the Son of Man. There are many places in the scriptures where we are reminded of his humanity. The Bible teaches that he was hungry. The Bible teaches that he was tired. In the back of a boat, he was asleep. He knew the joys of friendship. He was misunderstood and despised. He wept at the tomb of a loved one. He had to fight temptation and endure disappointment. He claimed to be the unique son of God. Before the world ever was, or before the human race ever existed, he said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. With these words, Jesus set himself aside from every other person that ever lived. In other words, Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I always am the eternal present. There's no past with Jesus and there's no future with Jesus. It's all in the ever present. And he's speaking to you tonight and he's speaking to all of us collectively and individually. In Colossians 1 it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, 
All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things hold together. This whole stadium would fly to pieces were it not for the fact that he is the thing that holds it together. Peter's statement in Matthew 16:16, 16, 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. When he came at Bethlehem, that was not his birth or his beginning. He had already, already, already existed. That was his incarnation. When Jesus came to Bethlehem, it wasn't the place of his origin. It was his incarnation. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. You know, it's interesting to me that Jesus never apologized for sin. He challenged others to prove any error in his thinking or in anything that he ever did. How do we explain Jesus from every other individual that ever lived? How do we explain Jesus from every other person? What is the basic cause of hate and greed and lust and war today? and racial injustice and racial division. Jeremiah said, gave the answer. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? King David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. I was born in sin, said David. He said, I was shapen in iniquity. The Bible says in Matthew 15, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. I think we need to do something about guns, but that's not the real problem. The real deep problem is in our hearts. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and thefts and blasphemous. All of these things come from the heart of men and women. How do you explain Jesus? His authority. No one ever spoke as this man spoke, says John 7. He forgave sin. No other prophet had ever forgiven sin. Muhammad didn't attempt that. Buddha didn't do that. No one else in history has ever said your sins are forgiven. He also had authority over nature. When the sea was boiling and the storm was raging, he just held up his hand and said, peace be still, and the sea quieted down and the storm stopped. He had authority over disease. Every sick person that ever came to him by faith, and he touched, he healed. But what about his death? different than any other person that ever was. You see, Jesus was executed. He was a criminal. He took our sins. He became sin for us who knew no sin. Can you imagine a person being the embodiment of sin? That's what Jesus was on the cross. Isaiah 53 says, God hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. In 1 Peter 2.24 it says, Who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree. Micah says that all of our sins are cast into the depths of the sea. I was reading today about that lake in Russia. That's the deepest water in the whole world. Thousands of feet down. Our sins are buried in the depths of the sea, the scripture says because of what Christ did on the cross. He became sin for us. He was executed for you. He took your judgment and your hell. You won't ever have to go to hell. You don't ever have to go before the great white throne judgment if you're in Christ. But everybody else will. The Bible says that there's coming a day when he's going to judge the whole world and you will stand before God at the great judgment, hundreds of you that are here tonight, and you won't stand with a great crowd like this tonight. You say, oh, we'll have a good time when we get there. No, you'll be alone. 
you're going to stand before God alone and give an account of what you did with Jesus and how you lived your life. And many of us are going to be terribly disappointed. And we're going to scream for mercy. But it's going to be too late. The Bible says that we will call for the rocks and the mountains to fall on top of us and hide us from him that sits on the throne. But we can't. And the crucifixion of Christ is a stumbling block to many people because it's foolishness, the Bible says, to those that perish. Many will accept the teaching of Christ when he says, love everybody. But they stop at the cross. At the cross is where you have to come before you can really know him. And you have to confess that you're a sinner and you have to repent from sin. And the word repentance means that you turn, that you change. You're going one direction in your life and you're willing to go another. You say, but Billy, I don't have that ability. I've tried to change. I've tried to do better, but I can't. No, you can't. But God will help you if you submit to him and say, Lord, I need your help. I need your help even to repent. I need your help even to have faith to believe the kind of faith that I must have. What about you? And then there's his resurrection. The Bible says that they took him out and they buried him after his death. But on the third day, he rose again. And he's alive tonight. When some of the disciples went out to the tomb where he was buried, there were two men there, two angels, that said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Jesus is alive. And the thing which inspired the disciples to go to the whole world with the gospel is the resurrection. We're talking about a living Christ that can come into your life and heart today and change you and change your family and change your neighborhood and change Nashville and change Middle Tennessee and change all of the whole country if we'll let him. The The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. You have to believe that he not only died, but that he rose again. That's one half of it. One half is that you repent. You come and say, oh Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry that I've sinned. Please forgive me and help me to change. But then... You have to live the life. And there the resurrected Christ is there through the Holy Spirit to help you live the life after you've come to Christ. If Christ is not risen, then he's not God. And the tremendous force in history is unexplained. The Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus was persecuting Christians and killing Christians. He hated Jesus. And one day, there was a blinding light, and he fell down on his knees, and he knew it was Jesus. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? In Acts, the ninth chapter. And this is the question you must answer. Who is Jesus? That's the question of our generation. Who is Jesus? Jesus claimed, if Jesus claimed, to be God, knowing that he was not, he was a deceiver. If he thought that he was God and didn't know the difference, he was a maniac. Jesus was whom he claimed to be. God manifested in the flesh. Think of it, the mighty God that created those stars and those planets and this whole universe and holds it all together. He is the one that wants to come into your life, in your heart tonight in a new way. Oh, you might be a member of the church, you might have been confirmed and baptized and all the rest, but deep down inside you're just not sure. 
you're not certain that you're ready to meet God. You're not certain that you'll escape that great judgment. You must face the question that Pilate asked. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Pilate washed his hands. Tonight you can wash your hands and leave and leave the stadium and go back to the old life and nothing has happened. But Paul was fearful. He was trembling. He was astonished. He was amazed. But he asked the right question. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And Jesus said unto him, Arise and go. And that's what Jesus is saying to you tonight up in those stands and down here on this little stand. Arise and go. Get up out of your seat and make a new commitment to Jesus and make certain that your sins are forgiven. You see, this may be the only chance you'll ever have the rest of your life is tonight. You may not be able to come back to these meetings this week. You may never have another moment quite like this when the Holy Spirit has spoken to you as he's speaking tonight. And Jesus says in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and fellowship with him. Jesus is knocking at your heart's door tonight. He wants to come into your heart. He wants to change your life. He wants to have an impact in your community and in your family and in your life. He wants to give you peace and joy that you've never known before. He wants to forgive all your sins and he wants to give you assurance that if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven. You can have that assurance tonight before you leave here. And I'm going to ask you to do something that may be very difficult for you to do. But when Jesus died on that cross, he was dying for you because he loved you. And he's asking you to come and to open your heart to him tonight. And if there's a doubt in your life about your relationship to Christ, you get up out of your seat right now and come and stand in front here on this beautiful stadium floor that they've put down. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. And come and stand here, and we're, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with all of you and give you some literature to help you before you, in your life, in the week to come. You get up and come right now, men, women, young people, hundreds of you. Just get up and come and stand here. That's all. By that act, you're saying to God, I do open my heart to Jesus who died for me and who rose again and who's alive tonight. And he's knocking at my heart's door. I can sense it. You get up and come. We're going to wait on you right now. If you've come with a group, they'll wait on you. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait. There's plenty of time. This is the most important moment in your life. Don't miss it. Quickly, from the, up in the top stands, you get up and come. It'll take you a little time. It'll take you four or five minutes, so come. We're going to be here to pray with you and to talk with you and to help you.
Now, while you're still coming, I want to say a word to all of you that will be watching by television. And you can make your commitment where you are. Wherever you are, you may be at home, you may be in a hotel room. I don't know where you are, but God is speaking to you. You make your commitment. Or you can call that number that you see on the screen. And there's somebody ready to talk to you right now and have a prayer with you. And we'll send you the same literature that we're going to give to people here tonight. You can make your commitment. You make it now. just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. You're invited on a journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. Retrace Billy Graham's path from humble farm boy to international ambassador of God's love through multimedia, photos, and memorabilia. But the fruit of the Spirit is love! That is a supernatural... Tour the restored Graham family home place, browse Ruth's attic bookstore, and have a meal at the Graham Brothers Dairy Bar. Enjoy special exhibits, events...